We're a month away from the 2018 national election. As the race gains momentum, we speak tonight with the Freedom Alliance Party, represented by party leader Mr. Jagat Karunaratne. Later on in the program, we also speak with Nazia Ali of the Fiji First Party. Good evening and welcome to the show. Good evening. As everyone is aware, you've joined hands with the Fiji Labour Party going into this election and both parties will contest the election as one. Yeah. We'd like to know, what is this partnership based on? As we said in, the, in our media release issued on the day, the, it is a partnership based on faith and trust. We agree on common ideals of both parties. It is a partnership, understanding, uniting on the ideals and uh, not dividing on different, our differences. And when you say that you agree on common ideals, um, I'm guessing this refers to your policies? Yes, policies basically is a couple of things. Rule of law, good governance, social justice, uh, freedom, and basic ideals that we believe in. So, Mr. Karunaratne, when you say that these are the five uh, pillars that you do agree on, is there any particular reason why you agree on these specifically? Do you feel that currently these are not being practiced in the country? No, it's not that. Uh, the main, main reason behind the whole thing is, as a party, Freedom Alliance, since its inception, we have been advocating very intensively about unity. We have been engaged in discussions with almost all the parties since then, since 2014, mm -hmm. even this time around. So Fiji Labour Party is also probably the only other party who has been pushing on the same agenda. In the end, when other parties decided this way and that way, we uh, stuck with our, our, our main principle and main objective. So in the end, we decided it is going to be just us. We need to do it. We need to send the right message to the people about unity. Well, we did invite uh, the uh, party leader for uh, FLP, Mr. Aman Ravinder Singh. However, he did decline to appear on the show. Is there any particular reason why you think he would not want to appear on the show with you? No, I think it was the understanding that this program is dedicated to a party leader per segment. And he felt that we should not be lumped in together just because we are now together because we are still operating as two different parties. And so just to clarify uh, regarding all the other issues that we will be touching on later on in the show, uh, when we do talk about certain things, you would be talking in your capacity just as uh, FAP leader or also speaking for Mr. Amand Ravindu Singh? No, I'll be speaking as the uh, Freedom Alliance mm -hmm. and I will, I'm more than happy to discuss about our partnership, our cooperation. Oh, thank you for right. going to work together. Yeah. So as we move on into the show, we'd like to get into some of the specificities of your relationship. But for now, let's talk about your manifesto. Yeah. Um, can, when can we expect one? Well, we have in 2014, we also issued a concept manifesto, theme manifesto. We have expanded from that. Mm -hmm. And we talked about our manifesto items in uh, dailies uh, in the last couple of months, uh, one by one in brief. So this is a manifesto that we have also presented to the Fiji Labour Party. So when they finally issue their final manifesto, there's one in, uh, in a summary form and they have mm -hmm. a detailed one, they will incorporate some, uh, some of those concepts. So that would be a joint manifesto that will be released? It will be, it will be at least from the conceptual level, uh, they will, because we have also gone through some of Labour Party manifesto. We have had discussions around that. So we strongly believe that there are so many things that, that we agree on. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that, that will be uh, coming out in the manifesto. Are there any particular issues that you don't agree on? Yes, there are. There are, there are many uh, uh, instances that we, are, we don't agree on, especially on the land issue. Mm -hmm. um, now, th this, is, this is the, the key issue, right? I, as a leader and individual, I strongly believe that there has to be two parties that are extreme ends. And these two parties should come together. The idea behind that is I strongly believe that we should not have a, a climate or environment where people are hiding behind the multiracial concept and they are not able to discuss what they want to discuss. So I, as an individual, strongly believe that if we have an extreme nationalistic Itoki movement or another Indian rights movement, these two entities must come together and then they should thrash out their differences openly, 
and the environment should be open to discuss those things rather than hiding it behind multilateralism. That's where would you where would you put your party along that spectrum? In what sense? Oh, the, you, you you spoke about two parties coming together from both sides of the extreme. Where would you put your party? We are a more liberal party. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, I would say, we are on the left wing, even including the Fiji Labour Party. Mm -hmm. But having said that, we also advocate certain very important key issues on its merit. Whether it is, it will be taken as a total extremist uh, idea is something that we are really not concerned about in the sense that we believe that these are the issues that we must talk about openly. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a lot of things to unpack from, from what you just said. You spoke a little about ethnicity and campaigning on this um, nationalist agenda. Do you think that there are certain parties that are pushing this agenda? In this election? If they do, I don't see any, any, anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, uh, if I go back a bit, uh, like there was, some, uh, there was a Bhutan Ronka, if I pronounce it name rightly. We need, I, in my own opinion, we need someone like that talking specifically about their own issues. We also need someone on the other side. At one time, maybe as Mr. Chowdhury, mm -hmm. who's, who's talking about the, the rights of the Indians. I think that has to be opened up. Well, the, the confusion, I guess, is with uh, Mr. Rambuka's recent statement that the Sodelpa party would be looking to expand its um, coverage of issues, especially in terms of other ethnicities in Fiji. Do you think he's being genuine in his outreach? I'm, I, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. I, I had a very close relationship with I have a so, so close relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And we have discussed these issues in detail in our personal conversations. I think he is genuinely believing that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Karunaratne, you also mentioned uh, previously that uh, FLP and FAP are not going to be uh, contesting this elections under one banner. Just a quick uh, review of the 2014 elections. Uh, FLP had bagged 2.35% votes, while the then Fiji United Freedom Party had 0.22% uh, of votes. That was still below the 5% threshold. Yes. Do you think that in this election with the partnership that uh, you have formed, that you will be able to meet the threshold this time or maybe you know, push forward? Definitely, most definitely. Uh, one of the things I personally believe in, again, a uh, lot of leaders have not realized the impact that it can have on the message of unity. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe in that. And this is one of those messages that we are trying to take it to the people about the importance of unity by leaders coming together. We cannot talk about national unity when the leaders are divided at the political leaders level. I think we are sending the right signal by coming together. I, I strongly believe that this will make a very big difference this time around. Well, since you've been liaising with the FLP, would you be able to give your answer or maybe your point of view, your opinions on why there seems to be some sort of a confusion when it comes to the party leader? As it is, uh, we've been told that uh, Mr. Mahendra Chowdhury is the party leader. However, Mr. Aman Ravindra Singh is the parliamentary party leader. No. But FLP was not represented in the parliament. How does that make sense? Well, I think the concept behind that is obviously Mr. Chowdhury is not able to contest this time around. So they need to have a leader taking the candidates to the elections. Mm -hmm. So that is where Mr. Singh comes in to lead the candidates to a selection with the determination that they will win seats and end up in parliament, then will become the leader of the, par uh, leader of the parliament. But a certain le level of... Um decision-making power does still rest with Mr. Chaudhary? Well, you should not say that. I think every party has a, a structure. Mm -hmm. You have a management board, you have committees, and then it, it goes up right. in the ladder. So that's how the decisions are made in, in almost all the parties. Well, leading forward into the elections, uh, we've only got less than a day, I suppose, because this would be going to air on Sunday. Nominations uh, for candidates will be uh, ending on uh, Monday at 12 p.m. So far, how many candidates has the FLP and FAP partnership forwarded? Uh, FLP submitted their candidates on Friday. I believe that they have submitted 25 names on Friday. 
and I believe that they will be submitting the rest of the, the candidates on Monday early morning. So that's 25 just from FLP? Uh, at the way that we are going into the elections, all the candidates will be under FLP. I see. Uh, if you, even FAP? Uh, FAP candidates, candidates uh, are going to go under the banner okay. of FLP. Um, so these nominations that will be made on Monday, can we expect a full 51 candidate list? We have given the, the list that we had mm -hmm. to the, it's two, we were operating as two parties. So we have had a process where we had 79 applications, we have shortlisted 31 and we were looking for more. Mm -hmm. when, our, when we decided that we are coming together, we have forwarded our candidate list to the Fiji Labour Party to go through their process. Mm -hmm. So what is coming going to come out uh, and what has come out on Friday and what is going to come out on Monday is the outcome of their process. But just in essence, looking at numbers, can we expect a full 51 or not? I really cannot answer that question right now and it depends on because as we speak there is a workshop happening in Nandi. Mm -hmm. So uh, the outcome will be uh, from all that uh, come Monday. Okay, well moving on, looking at uh, what's uh, going to be happening come uh, campaigning period. Uh, recently you had your conviction quashed for the sedition uh, charges that were laid against you. Do you think that this is going to hurt the partnership's chances at the elections? Uh, no, because I'm, I'm, I'm an innocent person right now, uh, in, even though the court uh, case is before the court coming up. I would say that the case and being in prison really helped me in many ways. Uh, How so? When I reach out to the people, the first questions that are coming out to me about my, my experience in prison. Mm -hmm. So I start the conversation from there. So that makes it easier. And then I have a lot of things to share from my experience, what I, what I uh, learned from prison, uh, the different perspective of life. And then I reflect that on the society. Mm -hmm. So it, it is making it easier and it is making uh, people listen to me more. I have something different to talk about. And do you think that um, your personal experience has helped you in, in the political arena? Most definitely, most mm -hmm. definitely. The life in prison is, is something, something totally different to the, the, I mean obviously, to the world outside. One thing that I learned personally from prison is it's a total different perspective to life. Mm -hmm. To appreciate every little thing that we take for granted outside. That is one main experience that I, 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 I learned from um, prison life. Well, to contextualize it in the, uh, political, uh, uh, in the political arena, uh, should we say, um, looking at your experiences with what's happened, do you think that maybe that may have soured your, your outlook or maybe your perspective towards having a partnership with any of the other bigger parties? Definitely not. Definitely not. I, am, I, am, uh, I haven't gone into prison for for a crime that is known as a crime. Uh, I have gone to prison for sedition. Basically, what it means is I have gone against the government of the day. That's why but I went to prison But in that respect, for. I suppose anybody could be taken to prison if anyone were to voice their opinion, no? That's the danger that we are living in today. And do anyone you think, could. And yes. do you think that uh, if FLP and FAP were to uh, get into government that you would be changing laws surrounding that? Definitely, them? most definitely. Mm -hmm. As I was saying it in the very beginning, we need, to, we need to have an environment where people can voice their opinion freely. Is this what you say when you mean that the Fiji Labour Party and FAP are looking into uh, human rights going into this election? Is this something that's really important to you? Yes, definitely. Human rights is one of the main important areas that we are looking at. And how would you say in the previous years the Fiji government has uh, handled human rights. What's the state of human rights in Fiji? Okay, if you, now let's look at from the prison's perspective again. Now, in prison, majority of the blame is going to the commissioner, from the prisoners to the officers, because everything is decided by the commissioner himself, mm -hmm. including changing uh, normal cooked food to boiled food, or opening the gates of the prison after 5 p.m. Nothing can be done without its approval. So the leadership is centered around individuals. This is one of the biggest issues that I, as I see. So leadership should not be centered around one or two people. I can remember a couple of months ago, Mr. Attorney General was talking about publicly that people are approaching him to sort out their personal problems, marriage problems. So the question is, who created that leadership? 
What was the cause of that leadership? Before we go to break, just one quick question, uh, Mr. Karunaratne. You said that you are most concerned about uh, human rights. What about uh, women's uh, rights and protecting women, uh, you know, violence against women and children? In the past few years, we've seen uh, skyrocketing numbers of uh, pedophilia and rape and domestic violence and abuse. Do you think that uh, FLP and FAP are going to be looking to advocate on that as well? Well, we're seeing more of them being reported. Yes, yeah. human rights. When you say human rights, it's human rights. Indigenous rights is a human right. Women's rights is a human right. We are all humans. So we need to look at it holistically. And, and then the other aspect that you're talking about, so many crime, so much crime happening against women, against, I mean, rape, uh, other robberies and stuff like that. Being reported against. Women. Yes. Yeah. All that is happening. Again, I would say it is a reflection of the leadership. Mm -hmm. It comes down to leadership. What is what? What kind of leaders that we have today? Not only on the government side, overall mm -hmm. the leadership, and that is why it is very important this unification for both parties. We are sending a different signal. We are not trying to divide people into segments. We are trying to tell people that we must unite with our ideals. Let's not. Uh, let's not the differences uh, make us divide. Do you think that you can answer in your capacity as it is to say that uh, most of FLP and FAP are not taking part in this particular instance of violence against women and children? No, we, that's what I said. Definitely we are taking a stand on that mm -hmm. based on human rights and social justice. Thank you for that. Mr. Jagat, let's take the discussion to your manifesto. If I was to ask you the three most important issues that you'll be addressing in your manifesto, what are they? One is something that we have been advocating since 2014. Uh, the need of having a proper corporate structure initiated by the government. Something similar to the government that recently started about 10 million grant for the Tokyo business. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about much more than that in 2014. Mm -hmm. Something similar to the structure that is behind the Fijian Holdings, but opening it up to the, all the landowners. That is something that we are strongly advocating on. Basically, for the government to look at or transform into an enterprise model, rather than being a service model, where you can bring in the landowners into equitable participation. That is one of the key ones that we are we are advocating on since 2014. That's one of the ones that we are advocating this time around as well. That would, of course, mean that you'd have to uh, change the land bank uh, that's happened, but not rather the land bank, rather. Um, You've, you, you have a very interesting um, position on, on land management, right? Yep. We'd like, to, we'd like to know what your position is uh, in terms of um, availability of land, and especially native land. Yes, th that is... That is, I believe, as a leader of a Freedom Alliance, as an individual as well. This is the key issue that we are facing in Fiji. Since independence, the land issues haven't been resolved by any government. And that is the issue that must be resolved for Fiji to prosper. And this is why we are saying that there has to be a way. What we are proposing is pretty simple, if you really look at it. There will be a holding company major holding company managed by uh, independent or the government assisted organization then the land owning units to form their own companies and then take the lease under their own company name so that the leases are not going to go away to anybody else so the lease remains with them the ownership remains with them then then they use that in to coming into equitable partnership with the investment and then we have a clusters of companies all around and the land is owned by the landowners by the themselves and then coming into partnerships with well, the Well, in theory, any... it seems like it would, be, uh, it would be quite a good working model, but how do you think that this is going to translate in, in real time to uh, you know, the everyday Fijian? It is not being translated to the everyday Fijian because even if you look at TLTB, for example, the landowners does not have the money to get even the lease arrangement organized because the TLTB is charging fees for that. They don't have that kind of money. That is the biggest problem. So that is why we need a structure where it can be facilitated. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that is why the corporate and maybe TLD, TLTV as a service organization that can assist the corporate. And the whole thing has to be changed. Um, do you think that land is safe under the current constitution? Fiji First keeps going around saying land is safe. It's, it's never been this safe. Well, as a party, again, we discourage leasing. So the Fiji First government is talking about under land, under land bank concept and the, all the other concepts about leases. When the minute that we talk about 99 year or 30 year lease, I wouldn't take it as land is safe. 99 year period is a long, long, long time. And you never know what will happen during that period. So how can we say the land is safe when we are encouraging 99 year lease? Concept? Well, I think safety in that sense, I mean, even according to the constitution is uh, freedom from permanent alienation of land. Right, you've got a legal background under the constitution. Do you think that land um, is safe? You can have, uh, as you also know, you can have a lot of things, fundamental principles in the constitution. When it comes to execution and subsidy laws is the one that uh, determines what will happen. And with that in place, you can say, okay, let's, let's put it in a different way. I have a freehold land. It cannot be alienated from me ever. Similarly, the native landowners will never allow it to be alienated from them, whether it's in the constitution or not. But now, the laws that we are harping about should not be only about the constitution. It should be about how they can be assisted in to come, come free their land while keeping the ownership to themselves into the investment models. That is the, that is the challenge that we so have. This, this model that you're proposing, it's a... Uh it's, it's different. Um, has there been any practice of this in any other country where there's native yes, land? Yes, there, there, there had been. See, uh, to put it in a summary form, uh, I'm a born Sri Lankan. Uh, everybody knows that. The issues that we have been having in Fiji today, we went through 30 years ago. Issues about land, issues about ethnic uh, conflicts, and all that we went through. So we have learned from that. One of the things that, that, that come, came out during that time is this land concept. Mm -hmm. And that I'm advocating here about. And we had a company that was in, went into a partnership with 2% and today is sitting at 8 billion, owned by the natives. And it is about how we, well we can structure it, organize it, and then how well the government of the day can facilitate it by having regulating laws to support that. And do you think you would have the support of native Fijians if, if you tried to implement this system? 100%. I, wherever I have been talking since 2014, even before, before I came into politics, this is the same thing that the landowners are talking about, but in different, different languages. But that is why we need to bring it under one umbrella and then make awareness, proper awareness. Well, before we get back to the other two uh, main uh, themes that the manifesto will be addressing, on the lighter side of things, um, Recent, not recently, rather, some time ago, you were given chiefly status by the people of Ra. Do you think that with that in mind, with the, that's giving you some sort of a push, or maybe you feel like you have liaised with the uh, locals enough to get an understanding of what it is that they're going through? That's why you thought of this particular concept? Not really, not really. It is a concept that made me part of Fijians today, Itoki people today. In, in, uh, in, even before I came into the political arena, I was involved with the landowners on investments. And during that period, I understood their problems. That's when I started talking to them about, hey, th th there are other ways that you can do this. And when I was explaining my own concept without knowing that there was this person uh, many decades ago called Apollo Siranawai, and then they started believing that this is the reincarnation of Apollo Siranawai because I'm talking about the same thing that that, that person was talking about. Mm -hmm. So. So that's where the acceptance came in. That's where the chiefly or oh, the had been adopted to the, the, the Ra people came about. So just to clarify, I suppose there's no connection whatsoever with you being a descendant of anyone from Ra? Uh, they believe that so. They, they believe, believe that, they but believe, you don't? Uh, I believe what they believe. <laughs> <laughs> 
let me put it that way, because they believe that there were two brothers who uh, went on a voyage and one ended up in Sri Lanka. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll move on we'll to something else uh, right. instead but of getting carried away. Right. What about the other two uh, common grounds or things that the manifesto will be exploring? One, of course, you've talked about is land. What is the second one? Uh, there are uh, a couple of things. One is the medical uh, health sector. Health sector, what we are advocating on is to have an insurance policy for all Fijians. And then it is entirely uh, supported and assisted by insurance. One way of doing it is if you know, like majority of the employees are covered by the employer's medical scheme, usually. But what happens when they turn 55, unfortunately the retired retirement age is 55 now, the moment you walk out, you lose that. Mm -hmm. But how would the FAP and FLP government, should they get into power, actually have the resources to implement this? Where would the money be coming from? The ma this question is, is a common question by the journalists. Um, let's, let's go back. When the VAT was reduced from 15 to 9%, 9% people didn't ask where the money is coming, going to come from to, to get the uh, gap back in. Mm -hmm. A government's job is to find the money and one of the ways that the current government and the previous government have been finding money by uh, by taxes this is where the previous concept that I talked about having investments bringing resources into a corporate structure will help to generate that money if we are talking about having a five billion dollar investment with the landowners tomorrow we can do that and that's a $5 billion investment coming in. Mm -hmm. What more do we need in terms of finding the money? Fiji is a small family with so much resources around us. It's about how we are going to utilize them. Thank you. Thank you. One of the policies that you were looking to implement is the healthcare system that you'll be looking at implementing a, an, an insurance policy for every Fijian. Now you've mentioned that for those who are working at 55 that ends, but what about the everyday Fijian? What happens after that? Let's start with the, 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 the workforce. So what we're talking about first is extending that employer's policy for life. That can be done. If you, somebody start working at the age of 25, by the time if, if that person is paying $1,000 a year for his insurance, it's 30, uh, 30 years, $30,000 is paid. But the moment that, he, that person leaves, that the, when the person needs the care the most, he doesn't have a policy. So one first thing to do is to extend that for life. Then we have the low-income earners and the needy. Mm. That is a sector that we must look at to subsidize from the government. And then again, it is, not, it is, an, it is about allocating certain budget for that and then handing over the responsibility to the insurance companies. And with this, this is one of the areas where Labour Party policy also comes in, where they are talking about getting into privatization of health sector, mm -hmm. which we also believe that we say we need to look at many, se many sectors in the government should, from, s from service level, we should transform them into uh, privatization or commercialization eventually. That way we can provide better service to people. But you cannot do that in isolation just by privatizing the hospitals. Mm -hmm. You need to have a total package, you need to have a holistic approach, like insurance, where everybody can have access to it. And a, lot of pro uh, a lot of countries um, have had pro problems when they've uh, privatized certain aspects of the public sector. Um, there are some examples, I think, from New Zealand having to buy back some of its um, uh, railway services after having it privatized because services weren't as efficient. Now, when something is under the public sector, you do guarantee a certain level of uh, efficient service delivery, right? Yes. And can you guarantee that with corporatization? It can be guaranteed with corporate corporatization. Plus, also, as I was talking in, in, the, in the earlier segment, uh, with having a, a corporate structure with policies and the government policies are supported by uh, to implement that. And then these companies also to come under the structure. So that way we have a sort of control uh, on the on the main main structure and the model that we are talking about. You mentioned um, poverty earlier. Earlier this week, the head of the Catholic Church released some um, 
false information on, on poverty rates and income inequality in Fiji. And although they've apologized since, we'd like to know what your thoughts are on uh, the poverty rate in Fiji. Well, the, there are lots of statistics and uh, data and information uh, released by the government and other NGOs and uh, International Monetary Fund and all that. Those are the uh, facts and statistics that the people, the academia and the economics um, rely on. Mm -hmm. What we rely on in what we see on the, on the ground. We see people day in and day out struggling to put food on the table. And that is poverty to us. Does that mean that you're disregarding the, the numbers that have been put forward? Or does that mean that you have a separate uh, view? Of course, because we personally, we cannot totally rely on the, on the information dished out because there's no way that they, that they can validate against an independent, uh, independent uh, organization or independent statistics. The information is not available. This is one of the key issues even the UN ambassador has highlighted. The information is not available to the public. So we need to rely on something, and it is best to rely on what is in people's pocket. I well, suppose I think I think we can agree that like, uh, no one says that poverty has been completely eradicated from Fiji, yes. but there is a lot of um, quoting of the statistic that poverty has never been so low in Fiji. Would you agree with that? Well, as we move on with the rest of the world, uh, people rely on money than the resources that they have. So there is a natural transition of people having money in their pocket. There, there, there may have been a decade before that people did not have a cent in their pocket, but they had all the resources around them. So if you are looking at the monetary value, of course, then you will say the poverty has uh, eradicated because people have money in their pocket. But not necessarily poverty has gone down. Okay. Well, that's your view on that. Looking at uh, putting money into people's pockets, something that's been quite a hot topic amongst most of the political parties leading into this election, they are talking about minimum wage, to clarify, for unskilled workers. Some are uh, proposing a $4 increase, some are saying uh, they bring it up to $5, one has even said up to $10. Yes. Is there any particular wage rate or any number that the FLP, FAP your partnership is looking at? FLP is looking at 350 in their manifesto, if I read it correctly, and then extending it to four and five eventually. Uh, from Freedom Alliance, what we believe in is that you cannot look at minimum wage again in isolation. It is just a number that people are throwing at to attract people mm -hmm. or the support. What we are saying is we need to be realistic about it. We need to make sure that people as a whole are uplifted. That's why one of our themes is growing together. We need to look at concepts of growing together. When we grow together, naturally, the wages and the minimum wage will, will, will lift with it. So that means that since, uh, as you stated, FLP is looking at $3.50 and then increasing it to $4 later on, FAP would not have a stand on any particular number as yet? We would not put a number to it. Okay. What we say is we must lift up everybody's standards. Then from, what you're, from what you're saying, it seems like you think that this is not even an important issue in the first place. It's just something that one person started to talk about and then everyone else just gradually picked up? I um, mean, you, uh, you can put it that way, but in, in, in essence, the issue is this. People are struggling. So people are looking at the parties or leaders who are of, uh, offering them solutions. So one of the solutions is $4 minimum wage, $5 living wage, $10 minimum wage. These are the, 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 the numbers that the parties are throwing at. But we do not know, I do not know personally, the implementation process that they're talking about. Maybe they are talking about something like us to lift up everybody's uh, standards. Right. Maybe that. But what is coming out is a number. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jagat, I can understand that you've articulated your opinion on that. But looking at it realistically, how do you think that even these numbers, even FLP saying $3.50 and the rest of the party saying $4, $5, $10 an hour, do you think that it would be sustainable if they implemented it immediately overnight or do you think that they would be implementing it in stages as it is uh, according to what has been put out in the press about Mr. Bhiman Prasad, NFP leader talking about bringing up 
the wage to $5 an hour. But uh, in correspondence with uh, this businesswoman, he had said that it would be introduced in stages. Do you think that that's some sort of tomfoolery that's happening, trying to um, sort of pull a quick one over the people of Fiji? No, there are certain things that you must take action immediately. There are certain things that you need to implement straight away. Minimum wage could be one of them. For example, if a loaf of bread price goes up to $5 tomorrow, you need to get adjusted to it. But how Things will go around, and, and that's how it always happens. But how do you think it would be sustainable? How do you think that it would filter down, especially if it were to be introduced at, a, at any particular number, at any particular level? If, we're, if it were to be introduced immediately, you don't think that that would have a backlash or a domino effect? There will be. There will obviously, the same, same example that I was taking before, if the loaf of bread price goes up to $5 tomorrow for whatever reason, there will be an impact. And that impact has to be managed by the administrator at, at the time. Thank you for that. Now, Jagat, uh, continuing on with uh, what we were talking about in the previous segment with minimum wage rate, you said that it would actually benefit Fiji if the uh, minimum wage rate, if it were to be increased, were to be implemented overnight. Now, I can understand that those out there who are uh, unskilled laborers who would be happy about it but then to think about it how would that actually happen I mean if you have a business and you have someone that uh, you employ uh, with with what the government is currently doing giving these small uh, and micro enterprise business grants and uh, helping those uh, Fijians out starting off with their with the income earning you don't think that it would actually put a stop to that it won't stunt their growth nothing will stop uh, there are things that the, this government has also implemented overnight. People got used to it. People uh, eventually got their hands around it. Mm. And it is similar in any concept. Thank okay. you. So, Mr. Jagat, the election is being fought on two fronts, social media and mainstream media. Um, and there are a lot of lies and false information being circulated on social media. What do you think of the campaign on race and religion? that's going on on social media? As I said at the, in the beginning of this program, we need to have a, a very free environment where people can talk about almost anything. We, sh we cannot have an oppressive environment where people are scared to talk about. And one of the things that happen as a result is the frustrations are getting boiled up and then people create fake profiles and they are venting their frustrations out. That is because we do not have that environment and as I said in the beginning, if we have two extreme parties confronting each other, that's the most beautiful thing that can happen. Because we know what exactly in, in your mind and what exactly in your mind, and we can come, come to some consensus. The harmony and peace cannot be built by force. It, it can be only be built by consensus. So there are two things to that. Number one is, is, is the party factor. We'll get to that later on. But um, don't you think that when people are given this, this unchecked freedom, you'll have hate speech like what you see coming out at the moment? So don't you think there should be some sort of restriction? There has to be moderate restrictions. There has, should not be restrictions where I, as a politician or a candidate, need to think twice before I speak because tomorrow I'll be uh, taken to court, dragged into court for sedition. Mm -hmm. And that, should, that environment should not be there. There has to be certain, I mean these laws are there already in defamation and the other areas, that as you know probably. Um, we should not have an environment which is oppressive and suppress people's feelings. That is, that is the main thing. The more you have that, the more frustrations will build and the more of these things will come out. So you also mentioned in your, in your previous answer that two parties having um, good healthy discourse on issues is a good thing. But there are a lot of parties that for the previous years have been campaigning on race and religion in particular. There's one particular party that seems to be pushing a nationalist agenda. Do you think that people should look at ethnicity when they are campaigning? Well, if you really look at the government, I mean, they're doing the same thing as far as I'm concerned. And oh, what do you mean by that? Mr. Prime Minister has been attacking National Federation Party, openly talking about Indo-Fijians and Indians. 
why do we even talk about race in the political campaign if we don't need to bring that research out why do we need to do that and why do a government who is harping about if i use the word about equality and uh, racial harmony talk about these issues don't talk about it if you are truly equal truly wanting to do something and last thing uh, not the last thing one of the things that i want to say is if you are really genuine about this equality and unity invite the other parties to join with you mm-hmm. and then see uh, whether we can look at something like government of national unity that is the basis to unity not about uh, talking about while we're on this topic do you think every fijian should be called a fijian we should not confuse with the ethnicity and the and the citizenship under the constitution do you think everyone should be recognized as a fijian that is the the name that is given now and and someone is if someone is saying i all of a sudden feel home today because i'm called a fijian i would say i was a fijian the moment i fell in love with the country and that mm-hmm. is how people should look at it not the name some people have reservations about being called something they are not some people have reservations about um, that being their identity and we have come to the crossroads we have already went past that and that is gelling well with people right now mm-hmm. and it's not something that i think we should try and change right now um, but what is more important is building consensus if we do not build consensus between races there's no way anything would of this sort is going to help name fijian doesn't mean anything uh, if we are not together of course anyone who is in parliament will have to look out for the uh, best interests of anyone who is in fiji or calls himself a fijian looking at post elections should in the aftermath of elections flp and fap's partnership not have the majority do you see this partnership looking for a coalition with any other party this is a very interesting subject I strongly believe that the coalition and the unity must happen before. If anyone is talking about coalition after, that is simply selfish. And But as per the electoral act, so would far, would you say it's deceiving voters if, if for example, you campaign on a certain number of issues, and then after the election, after you see the results, you decide to go with a party that doesn't really share your ideals? That is exactly the point. the exact the point i can remember one of the leaders was saying that we are willing to go with any party after the elections and that is hypocrisy to me especially with the current government the opposition when they were in the opposition they have been bringing out some good proposals well, the gov- government kept on rejecting them so you have a very clear conflict of policies and come in like after elections you are basically saying that let me look at the profit that you got let me see how much i have and then see whether we can benefit from it and that is why i'm calling it selfish i strongly say that that is selfish and that is based simply is hypocrisy you can't do that well, and based on that if a party is advocating on one line now and then saying that we are going to form a coalition with the government tomorrow and these are the people that we are trying to attract to come out and vote for us mm. and why would they vote for you when you are saying that you are going to work with them again well not to discourage or uh sort of discredit what it is you've said but just in a nutshell mr karunaratne if it were to come to that if push came to shove who do you think in your capacity as leader of fap the partnership that flp and fap has if you had to form a coalition who do you think that you would go with i would personally go with sorel pai at any time at any time any given time. the differences that uh, flp and sorel pai have had in the past we i don't see there are any differences that's what i said in the beginning we must look at uniting on our ideals as long as we can achieve that do you yeah. think you can work with the the fiji first party as long as they can invite okay because uh, opposition has always been approaching by bringing proposals and they have been rejecting mm-hmm. so how can you even think of a party that has always been rejecting others and how and what about nfp nfp is another party to look at uh, but to me i'm confused on the on the path that they're trying to take uh, that's the confusion that i have what do you mean uh, in the in the last for the record program or two one before i can remember him saying about post coalition right i don't agree with that that's defeating the purpose of unity 
you need to agree now. Because it is important thing is sending that message to the people that we are together. And that defeats the purpose. Second is I believe the post coalition in, uh, post election coalition is selfish. Mm -hmm. Third is they are talking about forming a coalition with Fiji first. And I'm confused. Lastly, Mr. Mr. Jagat, to anyone watching at home who may not have made up their minds yet, why should you become the next Prime Minister of Fiji? I think because I'm the only person who can unite Fiji. Because I don't belong to an ethnic segment. Because I don't belong to a certain... And I can cross borders anytime. And I can bring people together. And this is what I'm trying to do, whether is a prime minister or whether in, in a per, uh, capacity as a person on the street, that is what I want to do. Uh, why, what I want to do is to bring this nation together one day and I'm hoping to do that in whatever capacity. It doesn't need to be the prime minister. If I can achieve that, that I have been trying very hard over the last seven, eight years and I will continue to do so. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you for your time. We wish you and the Freedom Alliance Party all the very best for the upcoming elections. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Ms. Ali, welcome to For the Record and good evening. Good evening. You've been in the headlines recently uh, because you have been disqualified from standing as a Fiji First candidate in the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. For the benefit of Fijians watching, uh, please explain the situation to us. Um, the, one of the requirements of uh, any candidate that stands for election is to be staying in the country for 18 months in the past two years from the date of nomination. Um, I, w I missed out on, on that because I was away for a little longer than I was expected to be. Um, I, I was in the country for under 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, I have a business and most of my work requires me to travel. Um, I run a magazine company and one of the magazines that we publish is the in-flight magazine for Fiji Airways. And obviously Fiji Airways flies all around the globe Mm -hmm. And you have to travel to cover those destinations. And I had to be one of the people that was traveling around um, the network to cover the stories, which got me out of the country quite a bit. Um, I wasn't missing in, in the country for a block of six months. It, it's very technical in this sense because I was traveling for a couple of days mm -hmm. each month. And there were also months where I didn't travel at all. But if you added everything up, it made me go a little over the, the quiet time that I was supposed to be here. And um, when <coughs> was this discovered? Because I'm guess, guessing the um, candidate vetting process is done by the party general secretary, mm -hmm. maybe with the party leader as well. So do you think it was an oversight on their part? I, I think it was something that was miscalculated in the sense that, you know, you're looking at two years and you'd obviously assume that it's this year and last year. but you, on the date of application, it's not the end of the year. So you had to include 2016 as well. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and because I traveled quite a bit, it was something that you know, I, I assumed that um, you had to be away for a block of six months. And even if I calculated this, the, the times that I was away, it didn't seem like I was away for six months. Um, and if you added every little trip, they accumulated to be the, the time that I was away for. Um, and it was something that was just, I would say, a miscalculation. It wasn't deliberate. I mean, I wouldn't be out there trying to get people to get, you know, support me if I knew I was, you know, I was not qualified in the first place. And, mm -hmm. and um, it is something that only the Department of Immigration can give you. You know, they had to go and get the numbers and calculate, and that's how... You know, you add up what makes up six months. So, Nazia, um, you being a businesswoman, uh, you, you have a pretty hectic schedule as it is. Why the move to the political arena? Why did you pursue a career in politics? Um, there, there are many th reasons why. I mean, it's not because I, you know, it's something that started now. Um, it is something that I've always believed in that I could do when I was much younger. You know, I always wanted to have an impact. I wanted to, you know, if you follow the course of my career, I have had five years in the UN. Mm. Uh, I worked in the area of political governance, you know, so I understand firsthand the barriers that women have in entering mm. into politics or in any level of decision making. 
Um, so it was something that I had worked towards from when I was you know, much younger. And um, you know, um, growing up in rural Fiji, you see some of the disadvantages that people like myself uh, go through, even just to have their voice heard. Mm. You know, um, I grew up in the 80s, and that was when the coup happened. Mm. So you already have a taste of what bad leadership was. Mm. So, and then when I was finishing high school, that's when the 2000 coup happened. You know, and <clears throat> my career and my path has been um, always uh, geared in a way that I wanted to help the public and to help the people. I'll tell you my journalism career started because of the 2000 coup. Mm. I saw how remote we were and how much we relied on the media for information just to make day-to-day -day decisions, you know, whether kids were sent to school, whether somebody like me who was offered a scholarship to go overseas was going to lose out, mm. you know. Then I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from government to be able to study at USP. Mm. But there were other people that I was growing up with. They were disadvantaged in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether there were curfews or, you know, things that were in place, we already knew what it was like, you know, not to have good leaders in the country. So I wanted to be one of those people who actually went there and ensured that we have you know, a prosperous society that we live in. So you've explained, uh, you know, your interest in, in politics and why you wanted to actually uh, enter the local political arena to uh, help have a voice for those that don't. But um, how did you go about actually entering it? Were you approached or did you approach uh, Fiji First? Um, it was something that came from me. I had recently gotten married and then I went through a number of... Um, let's say, objection from the public because I married a, a Hindu man and he, and I'm from a mixed background, so I had a tevu tevu and my mother is Ituke. And he wore the traditional attire and this is something really personal to me. Somebody said, you know, like on social media, people were saying, why is he wearing that? You know, he's not Ituke, why is he wearing, you know, tapa and getting married, you know, in that way. He's a, he's a Indo-Fijian, he should wear his own outfit. You know, whether it's a dhoti or sarwani, whatever it is. And then I realized, like, even till today, there's so much, you know, like, racism mm. that exists. And if I don't step up, step up now, you know, to talk about how we can unite, you know, to represent the people who are, who are always misrepresented, you know, who don't have a voice, you know, like, at the ground level, people want to be working together, want to be united. They don't... You know, I, I grew up in Bar, you know, like people speak each other's languages. People understand each other. You know, there's a lot of um, good relations mm. that exist. But because in certain levels and, you know, things that are filtered down, you know, some politicians trying to promote, you know, this racial divide. Mm. And I want to be one of the young voices that actually bring everybody together. So and, it was and, and because of that, and I looked at Fiji first, it was a party that promoted multiracial unity, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it promoted people uh, that work together, and it pushed for, uh, whether if you look at appointments, for example, people were chosen based on merit, not because they knew somebody or because they were from certain eth ethnic background. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do something about it so that we don't continue to have this. If I don't do it, who else will? I mean, as cliche as that may sound, it was something that I knew that I wanted to do, and I couldn't wait for anybody else to represent me. So for a combination of those reasons, that's why you chose Fiji first in, in yeah, particular. that is exactly why. And I also see the, the sort of good that they've brought into place, you know, the, the education access that you have for everybody, you know, free education. You know, I, I've gone out into the community. I talk to people, you know, not just as a youth, as somebody who is from the rural community. Mm -hmm. I understand how much having to not worry about school fees, bus fare, means to young mothers, young mm -hmm. parents, mm. you know, 70% of our population are below 40, you know, 40. Mm. And they are the bulk of the people that are benefiting from this. Thank you for that. So Nazia, in the previous segment, you were talking about uh, the factors that led you to 
actually pursue a career in politics and in particular leading you towards Fiji First. Now you've also mentioned that there are parties out there that are still uh, maybe covertly pushing the race and ethnic uh, barriers that are dividing Fijians. Do you think that this is going to create divisions leading into the uh, elections? I certainly think so. You know, um, when you look at only one um, segment of the community, you inadvertently, you know, like are looking at ignoring the other part of the community. Mm -hmm. I think leaders should look at everybody together because we're equal, mm -hmm. you know, because we're all human beings and we all deserve Know, to be treated fairly. So you've uh, been di you've been disqualified uh, from standing as a candidate in this elections, but you will be continuing to support Fiji First, correct? Yes. In, in what capacity will you be helping out in this year's election? Um, well, now I've been appointed the national um, youth coordinator, and I think that is a very important role because mm -hmm. the party places a lot of emphasis on the young people. You know, as I stated earlier, they make about seventy percent of the population. And the fact that they do have somebody like me mm -hmm. means that, you know, um, I'm able to reinforce the current group of candidates, mm -hmm. uh, young candidates that they have, mm -hmm. um, you know, and their capacity, you know, running for the elections mm -hmm. to ensure that not only the youths are represented, but the issues and what they, their concerns are also tabled. Mm -hmm. you, know? you have a unique perspective in the sense that you've mentioned you've seen the 87 coups, you've seen the 2000 coups, you've lived through that and that was one of the reasons so that uh, you've actually decided to get into politics. With that being the case, what's being regurgitated by most of the uh, older politicians, bringing back issues from the past, bringing back demons from the past, do you think that this is a bad idea because youth are very impressionable right now? Yeah, I think, you know, like we underestimate the intelligence of youth, you mm. know. Uh, when I go out there in the community, mm. they're very smart. Mm. You know, they know what they want from their leaders. Mm. And, you know, and if some, if leaders are going out there um, talking about the past, the negative past, and talking about how it was better in the past, mm -hmm. you know, they understand, you know, it's, uh, it's campaign talk, mm. mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when they're out, when, when y even if you look at social media, you see how the youth are speaking. They understand um, what has happened, and they also know what they want for their future. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to decide, they're going to decide uh, on, on a leader or somebody that is going to represent their issue, who's going mm -hmm. to lead the country, and they want to ensure that the country is prosperous. You know, nobody wants to live in a country that's, you know, regressing. Everybody wants to live in a, you know, a forward uh, forward-moving and a progressive country. And you think that Fiji First has done that so far? <coughs> yeah, I, I certainly believe so. This is exactly the reason why I applied to be one of the candidates. So let's talk about some issues that you're interested in. Um, if I asked you the most, single most important issue that was on your mind going into this election as an activist, what would that be? There would be a few. Um, but one of the things that I really want to uh, push forward is the the rights of women, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I know there are a lot of NGOs and women's uh, activist groups around that are pushing for it, but in Parliament you need not only um, the legislation, but you also need the women there, you know, making the decisions. Because women understand, you know, 50%, almost 50% of our population are women. You, we understand the issues that women have to go through. You know, you look at maternal health, for example. You know, um, if you look at our current population, a lot of the, you know, under 40 are the ones starting their family. You know, they want to ensure that they have good, um, you know, clinics that they go to. They want to ensure that the child is healthy. They want to ensure that, you know, that their pregnancy is, you know, is protected. You know, so for women, rural women, for example, the government has social welfare benefits for them. Then the month, the period of their pregnancy, they get some money which will help them ensure they buy fresh vegetables, you know, just ensure that they have a healthy meal, for, you know, for starters. And that mm -hmm. ensures that they're healthy and their baby is healthy. So when the baby is born, you know, they're more healthy than, you know, not being able to have had that access, which means that they have less bearing on the healthcare system, you know. Um, so it's kind of like a preventative approach. So I wanted to look at issues like that. The government is doing it, but I think, you know, we can, with more women, we can also look at that even deeper. 
Well, something that will hit home for you, uh, you've mentioned that you want to address women's rights and also uh, creating a safer environment for them. Right now, social media seems to be one of the environments and one of the factors that tend to make women and children feel unsafe. You have uh, all these derogatory comments that are posted. You have hate speech that is happening. You also have um, online bullying, cyber bullying that's happening. If, uh, if you were to give us an idea of what the youth can expect from the Fiji First government should they win the elections again. What do you think that they will be ad doing to address this? Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, um, the recent development in terms of um, the cyberbullying. You know, like it's not just subject to, you know, people who are in the public arena. It's mm. everybody. Right. So it is something that I'm sure that the government will look further into. Mm. You know, there was recently some developments in policies that looked at addressing this, mm. and there was a huge uproar about it in social media as well, because suddenly people felt like, oh, I have to watch about what I say. Mm. Mm -hmm. But why is it a negative thing? You have to always ensure what you say is, you know, is not impinging on the right of somebody else. People, you know, go say that they need, you know, their freedom of expression. Mm. But if your freedom of expression means that somebody is feeling hurt, mm. if somebody is feeling like they've been attacked on their race and religion, like I'm somebody who's been through quite a bit of that. Mm. And the moment I was announced as a candidate, you know, there were pictures of me that were out, you know, and we have people picking on my looks, uh, my sexuality, uh, my, you know, body parts, they talked about my breast and how, um, you know, because of that they're going to vote for me or because of that uh, I can't be a good leader, you know. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, women are always subjectified, you know, and objectified in this case because um, it, they become easy targets. Mm. And, and, you know, if we don't speak out about it, if we don't say anything against it, people will continue to do so. Do you reckon that's one of the reasons why women in the past, or maybe <coughs> even now, are hesitant to actually enter the political arena to stand up for other women? I think it's one of the barriers. You know, the other, you know there are many barriers for entry for women. You know, one is finance. You know, sometimes women don't have the finance to be going out campaigning. Well, you happen you know. to have a few uh, business women, uh, prominent business women, who are yeah. actually taking part this time, yeah. yourself included. Yeah, um, but not everybody, you know, has that access. You know, mm. so in terms of barrier to entering parliament, there are many barriers. Mm. And then one of the major ones is, you know, women are reluctant to stand because they're always subject to this, subject mm. to criticism mm. more than men. Um, when was the last time a man was, you know, uh, his bare chest was taken picture of and posted? Mm. You know, I was dressed. Mm. You know, I was in swimwear, but I was dressed. You know, uh, and they put the photograph of me, and it was taken as if like it was wrong mm. of me to wear swimwear and go out swimming. You know, if people continue to do that and people continue to support this sort of thinking, you know, it's a bad reflection of our society. Mm. And Thank we you. need to take it up from the top. Yeah. Thank you for that, Nazi. So continuing from where we left off in the last segment, uh, Ms. Ali, when you were first announced as a Fiji First candidate, a lot of people didn't react very kindly. Um, people questioned your qualification as a candidate. Did you find yourself constantly having to um, explain your choices, explain yourself, and to justify yourself? I mean, there is a certain level of, uh, of hypocrisy in it. We've had a lot of male candidates as well, and no one ever thinks to ask them about their qualifications. But it's not the same for women, is it? Um, yeah, it seems like you have to be doing double what men do to be actually able to just enter. You know? um, and that's what I was talking about, barriers of entry into politics, is that women have to do way, way more, and it seems like you have to be um, somebody that is almost impossible, you know, t to be able to enter. Um, a lot of people are expecting me, oh, so what have you done for this country? Mm -hmm. And they, they would have expected me to have promoted it, you know, promoted everything I had done all my life. Uh, I'm not somebody who, I'm, I maybe talk about some of the work I do, but I'm not somebody who publishes everything that I've achieved. Um, but if somebody did want to find out what I've done, they could just Google and on LinkedIn you see my CV. You get to know everything I've done. And this is something that people fail to see. 
But you know, having said that, I've also had a lot of people who have defended me, who actually know me and the work that I've done in the community, whether recently or in the past. Um, and obviously, these people get shunned and, you know, like they're told, oh, you don't know anything about this person. is just wanting to be popular, just wanting to go out in, into politics to make money. <laughs> I run a business. Do you see your disqualification causing any setbacks for the Fiji First Party leading into the elections now? I actually don't think so. I actually think, you know, it's, it reinforces the independence of the elections office and the electoral commission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people say that, oh, yeah, you know, in the beginning they were saying, oh, she was speak there because I'm related to the attorney general, which I'm actually not. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, if you connect all the dots somewhere, somehow I am probably related to him. But, you know, I'm not his sister or somebody who is closely related to him. So, you know, they, they, they said that this me being there had so many wrong reasons, you know. And so, and they would say that because of my religion, that uh, people would not really think that I would make it through, you know, because I was a token person who was just brought in because of who I was and what I, my relationship. So if you take that same idea, mm -hmm. you know, and if you saw that the, the party was the type that, you know, manipulated the Fiji Elections Office or manipulated the commission, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't be here. I would be out there campaigning, because, uh, you know, and asking for people to vote for me. I mean on, that same, on that same note, this election, a lot of people have been saying that a lot of the women candidates in many parties are uh, sort of token candidates that mm. they have been taken in for their popularity and um, not necessarily because of their merits. Would you like to comment on that? You know, I think, you know, we have to get away from looking at women just because you need to have a woman, you know, representative. Right. Um, you need to look at why it's important to have women in decision making because they bring the balance in the decision. You know, um, if you look at a family, uh, you have the father and the mother. You know, they, they collectively make decisions for the household. And that's how you, we look at the parliament as well. You know, you want to have both of them there. But when people say that, oh, they are just token, I mean, we don't want to discredit the women that are standing. Uh, they have worked hard as well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I would say about the party, the, the candidates from our party, there's 11 of us that you know, that were originally selected. And that's mm -hmm. quite a sizable amount, you know. And I would say that these are some of very qualified women who represent different segments of the society. They're not all, uh, you know, which PhDs or they're not all business women. You know, some, uh, there's a woman who is the leader, you know, of the local, uh, she's a sugarcane farmer. And she heads, you know, and she's from Tavua. She looks, she looks after so many cane farmers. And she represents the views and the interests of the cane farmers. Why do we have to say that, you know, like she's not qualified to be a leader? She's already a community leader. Right. So you mean that you would like to have women there offering a unique perspective and what would seem like a very male-dominated arena where you have people representing uh, the ordinary Fijian? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think, do you it's think every it woman's glass? right to ensure that their voice is heard. You know, that they are being represented. Do you think there's some sort of a glass ceiling when it comes to that in politics in Fiji? I mean, it's a, there's a glass ceiling in every area. In business, in politics, in all arena, women always have to fight. Well, you know, one to could make argue the point and say the Speaker of the House is a female. But she's just one, you know, like, you know, she's there, there's a start. They, but if you look at the current, you know, um, uh, situation, you know, uh, they were they are a little bit more than usual, mm. right. but if you're looking at the new set of women that are coming in, it's mm. it's quite positive to see that you know a lot of women are you know taking the stand to s stand for election. And I mean, I guess we're we're doing better than most countries, but then yeah, I mean the the, the minimum requirement is twenty percent. Right. You know, um, <coughs> people have signed on to um, international agreement like mm -hmm. Fiji has, and and the party we have more than twenty percent women, you know, that are running for elections. Mm -hmm. Well, women coming from different <coughs> backgrounds. You have uh, athletes, you have uh, businesswomen, you have uh, people who have been in the uh, media and in the communications industry as well. What do you think that these women should actively uh, campaign on to try and raise awareness on issues that are affecting 
those who will be casting their votes this time around? I think there's a number of things. Um, if you're looking at young people, you know, young people want security, young people want stability, mm -hmm. and that is something that the party is, you know, fighting for. Because, um, you know, when you're starting off your life as a young person, you want to ensure that, that everything that you do, from being educated to working, that, you know, things are secure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a time when in 1987, I saw like my whole neighborhood just cut into half because half the people just went to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, mm -hmm. you know. And for me, it was, you know, as a child, I grew up thinking, you know, like if this is the situation often, then it would mean that, you know, people that are well-to-do and people who are intelligent are leaving the country. And we're just left with, you know, the bare minimum who are just trying to make do. You know, so having a secure future, which is what the party promises, is something that I feel is something that we need to reinforce. Because um, when you have people talking about race issues, I mean, they bring things like that up, it causes division and causes uncertainty. And it makes people doubt their future, especially young people. So all they want to do is just pack up and go. And I have a lot of friends who have you know, who had done that too in the past because they felt like there was no, you know, um, no future. Mm -hmm. Well, now in your new capacity as a youth wing leader, uh, looking at campaigning that's going to be uh, happening leading up to elections, what do you think the party will be doing in order to touch base with the youth? We, we have already started doing that. You know, we, it's not something that we'll start now. We've been doing it already. We go out and we speak to the youth. We talk about their issues. We mm -hmm. ask them what their concerns are. Mm -hmm and what they would like, you know, and, and surprisingly, you know, you have them raising concerns about certain areas, but they also commend the work that the government has done. When you say concerns, what sort of concerns do they usually talk about? Um, they, you know, like they, they're varied, you know, because, you know, the aspirations of a youth, let's say, in, in a rural community uh, from, um, let's say, a rural interior community to a, maybe a rural from within Suva is slightly different to um, somebody who lives in the urban areas, mm -hmm. you know. So if I look at, um, let's say we look at Nusori, um, a youth there who's probably just about to have, a, who's in his early, uh, early 20s, young person who's pregnant, would want to make sure that they have a nearby hospital that they can go to for clinics and have, you know, like, have the delivery. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody in Suva would just want to make sure that, um, that, when they do go to the hospital, they're the first to be seen, you know. So uh, recently in, when in Bokasi, the, the, the health, the maternity unit there is now 24 hours. So the mm -hmm. women around the area are much happier, especially the young who are pregnant, that now they can go somewhere nearby, that in case they go into labor, they can just go somewhere near and not have to travel all the way to CWM, you know, and have this fear of, you know, giving birth on the way. Um, so things like that um, are some of the things that are coming up, you know. So they are positive, and the other areas that they're looking at, uh, I think a lot of the people that still live in the rural communities, they're worried about the sugar industry. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'd like to discuss that more, but uh, I, I suppose we'll have to discuss that after the break. Okay. So Ms. Ali, we'd like to know more about your background. I understand that you've got um, some knowledge in the communications industry and business as well. So tell us about your work as a publisher of a magazine. When did you start and what experiences does that involve? Um, so I started the company in late 2011. Um, <coughs> we, we bought the existing brand called My Life. Um, it was a magazine that was four years old then. And then we expanded it and we brought in a few more titles. Um, later on, we, we also took up the contract to do the in-flight magazine for Fiji Airways. Um, my role as publisher basically means that I try and find the money to ensure that the business is running. Mm -hmm. um, so I have an editorial team that is independent of me um, that collects the information. Um, but at the same time, I also have uh, oversight on what they do. Uh, the in-flight magazine is what we call a special publication, which is an in-house publication lo looked, um, that looks at ensuring that my client, which is Fiji Airways, and their needs are met. 
Um, so that is a project that I am currently quite very much involved in, whether collecting information or getting advertising for it. So I guess the reason why I asked is because how do you plan to use your business knowledge and communications knowledge to benefit Fiji? Um, you know, I think one of the things that we all agree that a lot of people do not um, fully understand the work that the government has done. And I think that that is some way that I can come in, you know, to ensure that everybody to the last person understand, you know, what, they, what the benefits are of certain policies that are in place, uh, because sometimes it gets lost in between, you know, in the communication channel. So it is an area that I thought could also in, um, uh, use improvement. And having the communication background, I not only in publishing, but in my previous jobs, um, I worked in a few regional uh, organization in the UN. Um, primary role was to ensure that messages were communicated to the right people through the right channel. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if somebody is in, in a rural area and if they don't have television, they miss out on this program, you know. So because now there is Walesi, you know, they can download it onto their phone and be able to watch it because there might be internet in, uh, field, uh, that is uh, penetrating to the area that they're in. Mm -hmm. So things like that, um, you know, like how do people get information mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the right information. Like even this idea about you know, rural women getting um, monthly allowance to help them during pregnancies. Not everybody is familiar with that. You know, so if people know, they will be able to utilize it. And, you know, um, you'll be able to ensure that women are very healthy and, and they have a good pregnancy. Well, with all of that, I'm sure that your interpersonal and intrapersonal skills have obviously uh, gotten way, way better. But I'm just a little interested. A lot of people have different opinions on Mr. Banimarama, and uh, some of them do happen to say that he's a little abrasive. He's a little rough around the edges. What's your personal experience been like with uh, working with him? In terms of his demeanor towards others, because a lot of people like to talk about him, don't they? Mm. Yeah, I mean, like to me, I've, I know, I've, my encounter with him has been over a number of years, you know, as a, gen as a former journalist and as somebody that I tend to meet in cocktails, you know, if I get invited to the same events, and then now as one of the, you know, as a party member. Um, he's been quite friendly to me all, you know, all the time, and I, I haven't had an experience where he's been abrupt in the sense that he's told me off or, you know, contrary to what people say, but from my recent, if, if, I, if you focus on my recent experience, he actually values what I have to say. He actually thinks that I bring in um, quite a lot to the party. So, you know, I think it's the same way about me as well. A lot of people just see a picture of me. They think I'm a beauty queen, and that's how far I'm, you know, how far I go. They don't see that I have, a, you know, an experience in working with political governors. They don't see that I've worked in media for a long time. They don't see that I was, you know, an educator at USP. I was a... Uh, tutor and elect assistant lecturer. So people don't really know you, so they just assume because a certain photographs make you look a certain way that that's who you are and that's your personality and your character. We're, we're, we're going into this election <coughs> with a lot of political parties having um, internal struggles and that's how their campaign has sort of been defined. And we don't hear a lot of that from the Fiji First Party. Uh, would you um, attribute that, that to the leadership of Mr. Beni Marama? Yeah, I think, you know, a, a good leader ensures that people understand their roles, in, you know, in, in, in an organization, um, so that you are not overstepping your boundary. But that doesn't mean that your rights are limited. It just means that there is a structure in place, you know, and there are reasons why you have structure to ensure that, you know, um, the wrong people are not you know, mm -hmm. doing things and misrepresenting, you know, and when everybody is um, going out there doing their own thing, you know, they're all branded the same way. And if you're miscommunicating, you know, giving wrong information and mis, you know, different ideas, people will be confused about what the organization really represents, you know, and that's the main thing about, you know, communicating an idea or an ideal um, that the party has, you know, and we want to ensure that we are united. And, and that we are. So in <coughs> essence, uh, Fiji First Party seems to be uh, working and running like a well-oiled machine with no cogs in it so far. Well, I would, I would say so. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, if, in a, if you take my case, for example, you know, they, I, I, I know that there are a lot of people that applied 
to be a candidate, you mm -hmm. know, in the hundreds, you know, 500, more than 500 people applied. And they picked the people that they felt made the best team, would represent people, and we all work well together. We help each other out, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, there's no bickering, there's no backbiting. You have people who have always worked together, and the young people that have come in, including myself, have been taken in very well by the, you know, the, the more seasoned politicians. How do you see the party uh, moving forward, given your disqualification? Um, obviously, they, there is a replacement for me, um, but because I haven't left the party, <laughs> I'm not joining another party, um, <laughs> I'm, I still believe in the reasons why I joined the party in the first place, and I would stick around and I'll make sure that, you know, we get back into government. And I want to make sure that a lot of young people also make it. Just looking at the elections itself, of course, like you said, uh, you know, the, you're still going to stand by the party. There are people who have uh, tried to stir up a little bit of discontent within communities saying that it's not right and it's not good to have governance by one leader or one party for too long. What are your thoughts on that? Four years too long, and I don't know uh, what people are thinking. We all live long lives, you know. Do we change every day? Do we want to change every four years? Um, and it takes a lot of, it takes some time for policies to really get into effect. You know, if we have one policy now, and then the next government comes in, and it's a different government, doesn't believe in that, and changes it, you know, yes, they will be doing their job, trying to do, you know, different changes, but the people on the ground are the ones that are going to be suffering. You know, the people who are currently benefiting, um, what does it mean to them? Does it mean that they will lose it? Does it mean it's going to change its, you know, dynamics? Uh, <coughs> it's about consistency. And, you know, the policies that are brought into place, some takes a while to really get, you know, get down to the community mm -hmm. level. Um, and you need to give it time. And you need to ensure that, you know, our leaders are given the chance to actually implement it. And it's not only, you know, people always talk about, oh, the politicians are doing this, this is the reason why our community is so bad. But there's a whole lot of channels, you know, that it goes through before it reaches you. You know, just because the policeman did something to you doesn't mean, oh, it's because the politicians are like this, the policemen are doing that. No, everybody is an individual and there is a system and a structure in place. And it takes time for everything to filter down. Well, thank you for that comment. Ms. Ali, as we uh, enter into the final segment of the show, tell us more about Fiji First. What do you make of other political parties in comparison with yours? I don't really compare, you know, like other political parties with ours because I, from the start, I, I was not, <coughs> I didn't, they didn't appeal to me for some basic reasons because one in particular was just looking after the interests of one ethnic group. And the other, you know, just by some of the statements they made, made me look, made it look like that my religion of people that followed Islam was, uh, you know, was marginalized. always, uh, you know, they, they attacked people who were, you know, either elected on merit or chosen on merit or, you know, um, appointed on merit mm -hmm. because of their religion. So I didn't want to be supporting something that actually disagreed with who I was. Um, and I've seen the things that Fiji First Government has done. You know, my Ito K side of the family, they own land, you know, that uh, Fiji Pine sort of uses. And recently they got quite a bit of bonus. And I saw how much it affected, you know, positively affected them. You know, I have an uncle who can't, who is not able to move around because his legs are amputated. His son was able to buy a vehicle so that he could take him to hospital whenever he could, and instead of waiting for the bus the next day, to be able to take him to the hospital whenever he got sick. So I see some of the positive things like immediately right before my eyes. You know, I see my neighbors who were affected during the cyclone, who were helped and then are able to rebuild their homes. You know, I've seen people in the recent cyclone who lost a few things, were able to access the thousand dollar grant from government to go and you know, put things back into their home. So when you see things, you know, it's already uh, an indication of, of a government that actually is out there for the people. You know, you, you say those things, but then a lot of people, to a lot of people out there, uh, 
those have publicly been called um, vote buying exercises, right? Yes. Well, those, like you've mentioned, um, Ziad, uh, the home care initiatives. The home care initiatives. They are humanitarian efforts on the part of uh, a government to help out its uh, its citizens. But there have also been a few things that have happened in the past few months. For example, the free Wi-Fi hotspots that have opened up and. Uh, uh, the new initiatives, the new policies that have been put forward by the government in the in new budget. A lot of people are saying that this is blatant vote buying. Do you agree with these statements? So we, people don't want these things? Do you want to in make sure that people are not advantaged? I mean, I think people always say that this is vote buying. So and if government doesn't do things to help its citizen, and then they'll say it's an in ineffective government. People will always look at negative things of anything positive. Anything that positive that comes out, people will say, oh, no, it's not enough. You know, it didn't come here, it didn't come there. So let's say, for example, the Walesi. It was, it's a phased approach. Every weekend, it's been launched different places around the country. Because it can't happen all at once, it's taking a short time, and now because elections are around the corner, does it mean that only Suva should be given Walesi and wait until elections, everything is over, and then comes after that, it means that the people all around the country will be disadvantaged. You know, they will not have access to this, um, to this service and the free Wi-Fi. You know, it's helping you exercise your freedom to access information. So, you know, in a sense, you're saying that it's not blatant vote buying. This is the is government not. trying to help. <laughs> it is. You know, there, these are plans in place that have been there all along. You know, I think people don't understand, you know, how government works. Mm. Um, they are plans, they are proposals that are made, and then they and they agreed to, and then slowly they are phased out because the minister himself is not going out there doing, you know, the infrastructure set up. He's not doing the wiring, and you know, he's not putting things physically. There are people on the ground, are, you know, down the channel, that mm. are doing the work, and it takes time to set things up. They, you'll have a policy today, mm. you know, it's effective, but the actual result will happen you know, probably a few months down the line, years down the line, because it takes so many changes in between. Mm. You know, that, that is the thing that's why we want to have the same party back, because they will ensure that what they started off continues. Uh, on that note, the government is, of course, going to be looking at uh, increasing the minimum wage rate. Right now, that seems to be quite a hot topic amongst most of the uh, political parties that are campaigning. <coughs> Some are giving figures... Um, Four dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. Someone said three dollars fifty an hour, but it seems like there seems to be some misconception with Fijians thinking that it's going to be implemented overnight. The government is currently already doing that, but it's going to be uh, looking at it in phases. And mm -hmm. do you think that this is also maybe vote buying tactics by other political parties? Well, obviously, you know, when parties go out. They want to ensure that you vote for them by promising you things that. You know, you know, you can't be sure whether they will go ahead with it. How will they fund? You know, how is will it false promising if you offer someone this and you're not able to deliver? But I, I cannot speak on the other parties, but I can speak on ours. We're not falsely promising something, uh, but you can see that when the government started off, the, the minimum wage was something else. You know, it was quite, it was much lower. So now it's two dollars um, sixty-eight. So if you really think about it. Um, it had been a phased approach, you know, so it's easy on businesses. And, and really, the minimum wage is on unskilled work. You know, if you look at a, a plumber, if you look at, a, you know, like a bricklayer, if you go out in Suva, you'll see. They get so much more, you know. And, and if you, if people are, mis, uh, you know, like, are talking as if everybody is getting this wage. Like, you have to think, if we, you know, this, for example, you look at, housemaids, you know, that's the minimum. Before, it was not regulated. You would give them $20 and they'll be happy with it. But now they get, a, you know, like a, a decent amount. You know, yes, it's not a lot, but it's something. Um, but it's a good start. You know, if you look at how it was before, you know, like people who had house, uh, who were housemaids or were, you know, let's say um, somebody who worked in your gardens or somebody who didn't have much skills were working around the house, they were just dependent on what 
somebody was willing to give them. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's regulated and they need to get, they need to be paid. Well, we're about to wrap up now. What is your message to those who are still hesitant or still unsure about what to expect from Fiji First uh, leading into the elections and what they can expect should they still form a government in the next, uh, next year? Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, like, see, see, look around you and see the good things that has come into place. Just look back 10, 10 years and see the changes. If in that many years so much has happened, you can imagine the kind of positive things that will come in the next 10 years or at least immediately in the next four years. And if you want to ensure that, you know, the benefits of what you get at the moment continues and even more, it's not just, you know, those policies are already in place. But if already you are at a good starting point, when they come back in, you know, it's going to get better. It's, uh, all I say is that it's only going to get up from here. You know? well, thank you very much for joining us today on the show. Uh, we wish you all the very best as youth leader of the Fiji First Party. That's all we have for you tonight. We'll see you next week. Good evening.